It's important to understand that in Python 3, a string, the str type, is an immutable sequence of Unicode characters. Immutable, again, meaning once the object is created, it can't be modified. So you can't take an existing string object and capitalize all the letters. You can take an existing string object and from it produce a new string object which has all the same characters but capitalized, but the original object cannot change. And when we say that the string is made up of Unicode characters, it's important to understand that how those characters are actually represented in memory, the encoding, uh, that's left up to Python. It's basically a abstract away detail. And as far as you're concerned, just like a list is a sequence of items, well, a string is a sequence of Unicode characters. The first character is at index 0, and the last character is at the index, which is the length of the string, minus 1. Now, of course, when we take a string and we write it to a file, or if we take some existing file and we read its data and get back a string, in those cases, then, encodings matter. But the way Python handles that is that when you open a file, the file object itself uh, has an associated encoding. And you don't have to specify one because by default it assumes UTF-8. But when you need to, you can open a file specifying some other encoding. And so anytime you read or write from that file, then the data you read from the file will be Unicode strings uh, produced from an assumption that the file is encoded with that encoding, with UTF-8 or UTF-16 or whatever. And when you write to the file, the, the strings you pass in, those Unicode characters will get encoded as bytes and written to the file using the encoding of the file object. So if you have some file which is encoded in, say, UTF-16, but then you open a file and specify a different encoding, and then you read from the file, well, the strings returned by the file's read method are going to be messed up. It's not going to be the correct text data because Python is making assumption of the wrong encoding. Now, if you want to deal with raw byte data, as we sometimes do, especially when reading and writing files, then for that purpose we have two types, bytes and byte array. The only difference being that bytes is an immutable sequence of bytes, whereas byte array is a mutable sequence of bytes. So with a byte array, you can actually modify the existing bytes of that object. If you wish to read and or write bytes to or from a file, you open the file but specify to open it in binary mode, and then the read method of that file object will return bytes objects, and the write method of that file object will expect you to pass in either bytes or byte array objects, not strings. So, it's very important to get this straight, the distinction between string objects, which are sequences of Unicode characters, and bytes objects and byte array objects, which are sequences of bytes. It's very easy to get confused about these differences, because when we read and write strings from files, the strings, of course, in the file are represented as a sequence of bytes, so there's some encoding involved. Unfortunately, the way things work in Python 2 tend to make this much more confusing. In Python 2, the default string type, str, the type of object you get when you express a string literal, uh, that is not actually a sequence of Unicode characters, but rather just an immutable sequence of bytes. So it's actually the semi-equivalent of Python 3's bytes type. If you wanted an immutable sequence of Unicode characters in Python 2, there's a separate type for that called Unicode. Remember that when Python was first created, uh, Unicode barely existed, and it didn't really take over the world until a good decade later. So it kind of made sense to conflate strings representing text data with strings representing bytes, because text in those days was almost always ASCII, and ASCII is generally one byte per character. Python 3 very sensibly corrects this mistake and makes string into a proper Unicode type. Unfortunately, it's this change in the basic string type, uh, which is the major obstacle of converting Python 2 code to Python 3. If you take some Python 2 code and you want to go through it and rewrite it for Python 3, uh, your biggest headache is probably uh, dealing with the logic behind strings, because if you're not careful, you can quite easily end up mishandling some text or binary data. In any case, if you ever find yourself getting confused about the nature of strings and binary data, I suggest you focus first on understanding how things work in Python 3, because Python 3 is much more sensible. Even though most code out there is still written in Python 2 rather than 3, uh, the way it handles strings and binary data really is a mistake. Now, when you write a string literal in Python, you can do so either in single quotes or double quotes. It doesn't matter. The only difference being that within single quotes, you have to escape a single quote character. Otherwise, it would be mistaken for the end delimiter of that string. Uh, and conversely, if you have a double quote string, then you have to escape double quote characters rather than single quote characters. Because again, otherwise, it would be mistaken for the end delimiter. 
So here in the top example, we have a single quote string, and so the single quote character is escaped, uh, but not the double quote character. And then in the bottom example, it's a double quote string, so the double quote character is escaped, but not the single quote character. Python also has what it calls triple quote strings, which are enclosed in three quote marks, either three single quote marks on both ends or three double quote marks on both ends. I generally favor using triple single quotes. The special thing about a triple quote string is that, well, first, we don't have to quote individual uh, single quote or double quote characters, only in the rare case that you might have three consecutive single quote characters or three consecutive double quote characters where you have to escape any of them. And the other special property of triple quote strings, the big selling point, is that they can be spread across multiple lines. So if you start a triple quote string, that string, you can put as many new lines you want in it, and it only ends until the triple quote uh, end delimiter is encountered. So if you have some big of chunk of text you want to make a string literal, it makes a lot of sense to uh, write it as a triple quote string rather than a single quote or double quote. Though, of course, generally it's considered bad practice to embed too much string data into your code. If you have a whole bunch of string data, uh, like really big chunks of text, generally then you would store them in the database or some external file, and then in the course of your program, read the text data from that file or from that database. Generally speaking, code files should contain code, not text data. A doc string in Python is simply a string which documents some class or function. It's a string which gets assigned to the special doc attribute of a function or class object. And it's a string which is returned when you invoke the built-in help function on a class or function object. So here, for example, we define a function foo, and then we assign to its doc attribute uh, a string. And then if we invoke uh, help on that object, then it's going to return that string. Python, however, has a special syntactical allowance for attaching the doc string to a function or class. If you write a string as the first line of that function body or class body, uh, that becomes the doc string. And because these documentation strings might be multiple lines long, we most commonly uh, write them as triple quote strings. This is actually the most common use of triple quote strings. Note that the doc string is written with the same indentation as if it were just a normal line of code. A very common thing to do is to take a number object and get from it a string, or take some string and parse it into a number. To convert a number into a string, we simply pass that number to the string constructor. So here, str 3.5 returns a string of three characters, reading 3.5. And likewise, if you invoke int with an argument string of a single character of the numeral 4, then that returns an actual number object representing the value 4, an int object. Uh, and similarly, a float with an argument string of 3.5, then returns an actual float object representing 3.5. Uh, and then in the last example here, notice if we try and get an int from the string 3.5, well, 3.5 isn't a valid int value, so this will raise an exception. So do understand that when you parse an int or a float, the string text must only consist of characters that can be parsed into a number of that type. Though float is more forgiving. Float with an argument of just the character 4, uh, returns a float value of 4.0. And also, any white space surrounding the number in the string, that's okay. It's not going to cause an exception. Any other additional text, however, will trigger an exception. Now, when converting between booleans and strings, well, if you simply pass the boolean values true or false to the stir constructor, then you get predictably a string reading true with a capital T or false with a capital F. Surprisingly, though, going the other way, if you try and pass a string to get parsed as a boolean, to the bool constructor, uh, you will get back either true or false, but what's really going on there is simply that, well, if the string has text in it, it'll return true because non-empty strings are true, but if the string is empty, it's false because Python considers empty strings to have the truth value of false. So there isn't actually any inbuilt way to parse uh, booleans expressed as strings back into booleans. It's really not something you want to do very often, but if it is something you want to do, you'll basically just have to write your own function that simply uh, checks the string and says, well, if it's equal to a string reading true, then return true. If it instead it matches a string reading false, then return false. Somewhat similarly with the built-in collection types, yes, you can pass them to the string constructor and get back a string representation of that collection. However, there isn't really a built-in means of going the other way. Uh, the closest thing to it is that there's a built-in function eval, short for evaluation, which takes a, a string representing any Python expression and then it parses that Python expression as Python code 
and evaluates it, returning the returned value. So here, if we pass in an expression that looks like a Python list literal, then of course we get back that list. However, using a val like this is generally frowned upon because a val is considered quite dangerous because it accepts any arbitrary string and just executes it as Python code. And that inherently is just a dangerous sort of thing for programs to be doing because it means that you have to be very careful of what kind of string ends up getting passed to the eval function. If you're taking user input and passing it to the eval function, uh, then you've provided a potential attack vector where some malicious user can try and pass in data that then gets uh, evaled, and in the course of that evaluation it might end up invoking, say, some function you don't want to be invoked at that time, and that can be quite dangerous. So when it comes to collection types and other kinds of complex objects, how exactly then you serialize those objects into strings and then deserialize them from strings back into objects, that's a pretty involved topic. Really, there are just many different ways you might want to do that, each with different virtues, so it's not something we'll cover here. Now, if you look at the Python string type, you'll find that it has many different methods for doing all sorts of commonly useful things you might want to do with strings. Going over all of them thoroughly would take quite a bit of time, so we'll just uh, quickly go down the list and discuss what what purpose they serve. Uh, first off, there's the uh, special add and mole operator methods. The add method, of course usually invoked with the plus operator, uh, will concatenate two strings together. So you take a string reading foo and a string reading bar, and you concatenate them and you get together a string reading foo bar. And again, be very very clear about Python strings is that they are always immutable. So this operation and all the ones we'll discuss subsequently, they never actually mutate a string, they never modify a string, they rather just produce some new string, which gets returned by the operation. So here the add method, when we say that it concatenates two strings, it doesn't modify either of those two strings. It produces from them a third string, which is returned by the operation. The mole method, the multiplication operator method, will multiply a string times a number, producing a string which is a concatenation of that string with itself as many times as is specified with the number. So if you have the string foo, and multiply it times 7, that'll read a string reading foo, 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 foo. The original string foo repeated 7 times. And again, this doesn't modify the existing string, it returns a new string. The original string object remains just as it was. Moving more quickly through the rest, the find, rfind, index, and rindex methods are all about uh, locating sub substring within a string. For example, you have some long string and you want to find if it has uh, the word hello in it somewhere then you pass as argument the substring which you wish to find. What gets returned is a number representing the index at which that substring is found within the string. So if the substring is found starting at index 7, then the number 7 is returned. If the substring is not found at all, well, in the case of find, it will return the value negative 1, but index will instead raise an exception. That's actually the only difference between find and index, is that index raises an exception, whereas find will return negative 1 when the substring isn't found. And as for the rindex and rfind methods, those are just like find and index, except instead of starting the search uh, from the start of the string, they will look for the substring starting from the end of the string, from the right side of the string, so to speak. That's why they have an r in front. The starts with method is passed a substring, and if that substring is found at the start of the string, of the string object, uh, then it returns true, otherwise it returns false ends with works just the same except it tries to find the substring at the tail of the string, at the end of the string rather than the start. The methods is alnum, is alpha, is decimal, is digit, is numeric, is identifier, is slower, is upper, is title, is space. Uh, these are all simple uh, boolean tests that determine whether or not the string conforms to some criteria. For example, the is alpha method returns true only if all the characters of the string are characters of the alphabet. Otherwise, if there's a space or a number or some, some other symbol, then it will return false. For another example, the isLower method will return true only if the string contains at least one letter character, and only if those letter characters are all lowercase. Otherwise, it will return false. The methods upper, lower, title, swap case, and capitalize, uh, these methods are all about modifying the case of the letters in the string. So upper, for example, will take the string and return a new string, which is just the same, except with all of the lowercase characters converted to uppercase. The methods center, are just, and l just all pad a string with extra spaces, either at the start or at the end or both. 
The center method is the one that pads spaces to both the start and the end of the string. You pass as argument the length of the padded string you want. So if I have a string that consists just of a 10 character long word, and then I invoke the center method with an argument of 100, I'll get back a string which is 100 characters in length, with 45 spaces tacked onto the front and 45 spaces tacked onto the end. And again, remember, we're not mutating the original string, we're producing this new string. The methods strip, lstrip, and rstrip are about removing leading white space or trailing white space, white space at the start of the string or at the end of the string. L and R here stand for left and right, so the lstrip method will just remove the white space at the start of the string, and rstrip will remove just this, the white space at the end of the string. The methods partition, rpartition, split, rsplit, and split lines are all about taking a string and breaking it into constituent parts. So the split method, for example, you pass to it some character, a string that's a single character long, and then it will return a list of strings where each string is a substring of the original string separated by the specified character. So one common use is you have a list with a bunch of things separated by commas. You want to split them up into separate strings. You invoke the split method, pass in a string consisting of just a comma character, and you get back a list of strings where each one is something that was separated by the commas in the original string. The method join essentially does the opposite of the split method. It takes a list of strings and joins them together. Confusingly though, the string on which you invoke the join method is the string which gets inserted between all the elements of the list. The list itself is what gets passed as argument to the join method. So for example, if you have a list of strings and you want to join them all together separated by commas, then you take a string which just consists of the comma character you invoke its join method and you pass to it that list, and that will return a single string with all of those strings in the list concatenated together, but separated by commas. The method expand tabs will take all the tabs in a string and convert them into spaces, the number of spaces specified by the argument you pass. The format method is, is really quite complicated, but it's basically about interpolating values into designated places within some string. It's more involved than I can explain here, but it's very, very useful. And finally, the encode method will return a bytes object. So again, our string is a sequence of Unicode characters, and when we invoke encode, we specify some encoding, and then the encode method will return a bytes object representing that sequence of Unicode characters in that encoding. So those are almost all of the string methods. There's a couple I left out, but that's most of them. If you want to see them described in more detail, you can look in the supplement, and of course you can always look in the Python docs. Python has another collection type, which it calls a tuple, and a tuple really is just like a list, except it's immutable. So you create a tuple that has some number of items in a set order from index 0 up to the last item, uh, but once you create the tuple you can't change it, you can't modify one of those values, you can't add any new values, and you can't remove any existing values. The term tuple, by the way, comes from mathematics. To create a tuple, we have a literal syntax, very much like we have a literal syntax with lists, except instead of square brackets, we use parentheses. And that's frankly confusing, because parentheses are already used to denote the order of operations in an expression, or to just surround any arbitrary expression for no particularly good reason, just for clarity. And of course, parentheses are also used to invoke a function. So it can be tricky at first to recognize from context when you're looking at a tuple rather than, say, the arguments of a function call. And it also means that Python has to have a special rule for when you have a tuple with just one item. Here we can see in the top example a tuple with three items, first the number three, a string reading high, and the number negative one. But then in the second example we have a tuple of just one item and we have to write a comma after the item. Otherwise it would be mistaken for just parentheses with a three inside, which is just a, an expression that returns that value. So parentheses with three comma inside is a tuple of one item, the value three, whereas parentheses with just the value three inside, that's just the value three itself, not a tuple. And lastly, if you see an empty pair of parentheses, and they're not the parentheses of a function call with no arguments, then well, that's just a tuple that's empty. It's a tuple with no items. Now, you may be asking, what's the point of tuples? Because we have lists already, and lists are just like tuples, except you can also modify them, which sounds better, right? Well, for certain purposes, especially in cases where you're dealing with smaller sequences of items, uh, you generally think of them as being a fixed set of values, a, a fixed sequence of values. 
So in those cases, you may want to use tuples because it sort of ensures that down the line, the sequence doesn't get mutated. Really, it's almost kind of a stylistic choice. You'll find that tuples are most commonly used for small groups of related items. For example, if you have a pair of coordinates, an x and a y coordinate, those are two separate numbers, but you can group them together as a tuple, and that sort of spares you from having to create a separate uh, point class that has a x member and a y member or something like that. So that's one common scenario where a tuple is used as sort of an ad hoc simple compound data type. The various collection types of Python are broadly grouped into two main categories. they are what are called the sequence types and what are called map types. Sequence types are collections where the items of the collection have a sense of defined order. This item is the first item at index 0, this item is the second item at index 1, and so on. The map or mapping collections, as they're sometimes called, uh, have no defined sense of order between their items. Rather, a map is a collection of key value pairs. So, of the types we've already seen, lists, tuples, strings, bytes, and byte arrays, those all fall under the category of a sequence, uh, whereas dictionary is the only type that falls under the category of map. And whereas there are actually a couple sequence types we haven't seen yet, dictionary really is the only built-in map type found in Python. Yet in Python we still talk about a map as if it's a broad category of types, even though we really only have just the one, because conceivably in your own code you might define uh, your own classes, which are collection types that operate like a map. There are a bunch of key value pairs. So for that purpose, it's still a useful concept to talk about maps, even though most of the time the term only applies to dictionaries. What the real significance of these two terms, sequence and map, come down to is that they define for some broad set of uh, types a common set of operations. Broadly speaking, all sequence types will have the operations A, B, and C, and all map types will have the operations X, Y, and Z. So, looking first at sequence types, these are the operations which pretty much all Python sequence types will have, uh, with the caveat that immutable sequences will be missing some of these operations for the obvious reasons that some operations will modify the sequence, and obviously those can't apply to the immutable sequence types. So, going over these briefly, first at the top you'll see a number of special methods, uh, most of which are operator methods, like add and mole, for example, are really just the methods invoked when you use the plus symbol operator on a sequence, or when you use the multiplication operator on a sequence. And first off, what the add method does with two sequences is concatenate them. So, say you have two lists, one with the first with three items, the second with two items. You uh, use the plus operator with both those lists as operands, and what you get back is a third list, a new list, that contains five items. Uh, first the three from the first operand, and then the two from the second operand. And this is just like we've already seen with strings, because strings, again, are a sequence type. So you use the add operator with two strings, you get a concatenation of the strings. And we already briefly discussed what mole does, the multiplication operator does with strings. Uh, the second operand is an integer, and it returns the multiplication of that string, meaning basically the same string, concatenated with itself n number of times. So the string foo times three returns a string reading foo foo foo, foo written three times. And likewise used with other sequences, like a, like a list of three items, uh, if you multiply that times four, then you'll end up with a list of twelve items, the same three items repeated four times. And this multiplication operator, just like with strings, doesn't actually modify the list. It doesn't modify the existing list, it creates a new one. The getItem methods, setItem methods, and delItem methods, as their names imply, will retrieve an item from the sequence, set an item from the sequence, that is, modify some existing item in the sequence, or delete an item from the sequence. And as we'll see later, there's an operator for invoking these methods, and that, of course, is what is usually used rather than invoking these uh, methods directly. And set item and del item, of course, will mutate the objects. So, of course, they only work on the mutable types, like lists, rather than tuples and strings. The contains method will return true when the argument is an item which is found in the collection, in the sequence. So I pass the number 3 to contains, and then it searches through the sequence to see if there's an item equal to 3. And be clear that contains uses an equality test, not an identity test, so it's just some value equal to 3, not necessarily the exact same uh, object itself. And contains also is a method which is usually invoked with an operator. The len method we've seen before, it returns the number of items in the collection, in the sequence. And usual practice is not to invoke this method directly, but rather to pass the object to the built-in function len, 
That is just len, not double underscore len, double underscore, just, just len. The index method we've already seen with string. You pass it an argument and then it checks to see whether that object is found somewhere in the collection, and if so, it turns the index at which it is found. The count method also searches for the occurrence of an object in a collection, except it returns the number of times it occurs, rather than the position where it's found. So you might have the same item at three places in the same list, and so the count method, when passed uh, a value equal to that item, it'll return three. The remove method also searches in the sequence for an item which is equal to the argument which you pass to remove, except whereas index will then return the position of that item, the index, uh, remove will simply remove it. And if it's not found in the sequence, then remove will throw an exception. The append method will append the argument you pass to it to the end of the sequence. Like with a list, we've done this many times, we append an item to the end. The extend method also appends to the end of the list, except it takes this argument another sequence, and it appends the individual items of that sequence one after the other to the end of the sequence. So in a way, extend is like concatenation, except we're actually modifying the original list. So this of course only works on mutable sequences. The insert method takes an index and a value, and it inserts that value at the specified index. The pot method will return and remove the last item in the sequence, so it's just a more convenient and efficient alternative to first getting the last item with get item, and then uh, using the remove method. The reverse method will reverse the order of the items in the sequence, and it does so not by returning a new sequence, but actually just by mutating the existing one, so of course it only works on the mutable sequence types. And finally, the sort method will sort the items in a sequence. And again, this is done by actually mutating the sequence, so it only works on the mutable types. As for maps, first off, we have most of the same special methods. We have getItem, setItem, delItem, contains, and len. And what they do is fairly evident, just the same thing applied to a map instead of a sequence. The only subtle thing to keep in mind is that the contains method will search only amongst the keys of the map, not the values. As for the methods unique to maps, first we have clear, which will, as the name implies, clear the contents of the map. It'll basically get rid of all the items, all the key value pairs. We invoke the from keys method by passing to it a sequence, and then we, what we get back is a new dictionary, a new map, containing just those items from the original with keys specified in the sequence. The get method works like get item except rather than throw an exception, if the key isn't found, it'll just return a default value, the value none, unless you actually pass to get a second argument, which is then the default value returned when the key isn't found. The items method will return a sequence of all the items in the dictionary, and it does so in the form of tuples, where the first item in the tuple is the key, and the second item is the corresponding value. The keys method will return a sequence of just the keys, and the values method will return a sequence of just the values. And the important thing to understand about items, keys, and values is that because maps have no concept of order of their items, the items, keys, and values you get back in these sequences are in no particular order. The pot method does the same thing as get, except if the key is found, it will then remove that item from the map. Pop item is just like pop, except it returns a tuple of the key value pair of the whole item, not just the value. The set default method will return the value of the specified key, but if no such key is found, it will set that key, it will assign to that key, and by default it assigns the default value of none to that key, but you can also pass to set default a second argument, which is then the value assigned in the case where the key isn't already found. So if a dictionary already has this key, just get me its value, otherwise assign it this default value. And lastly, the update method, you pass to it a map, and then the items of that map are assigned into the object of the method. So if the argument map has a key string foo with the value 3, then the object map has its key string foo given the value 3. So if it already had a key string foo, then it's simply updated with that value, the value 3. Otherwise, if it didn't have it already, then it's given this new item, this new key value pair. Now, I mentioned that getItem, setItem, contains, and delItem are all operator methods, so here they are in operator form. 
the expression x subscript y is equivalent to x dot get item with an argument of y. And if you assign the value z to x subscript y, that is the same as x dot set item with the arguments y and z. And y in x, in is a reserved word operator, that is equivalent to x dot contains y. Don't get too confused by the reversal of x and y. And finally, del x subscript y, that's equivalent to x dot del item y. Uh, and the thing to keep in mind about del, though, is it's not actually an operator, it's actually a kind of statement, like assignment is a kind of statement. So when you see del used, it's always used at the front of the statement. Now, when I went over the sequence operations, I didn't mention that they also have relational operator methods, the methods for less than, less than or equal to, greater than, and greater than or equal to. And these are the methods, respectively, LT, LE, GT, and GE. And what these relational operators do with number types is very evident. 3 less than 5 returns true because 3 is less than 5. What, though, does it mean for one sequence to be less than or greater than or equal to another? So here's actually how Python defines that behavior. The general idea is that Python goes through the corresponding pairs of the two sequences. That is, starting from index 0 in both sequences, it compares those two values. And then moving on to index 1, it compares those two values, the values of, at index 1 of both sequences. And it, it does this through the whole sequence until it finds a pair which differs. And that first pair which differs is used to determine which sequence is greater than the other. Obviously, if you get through the whole sequence and it turns out that all the pairs match, well, then the two sequences are equal. Neither is greater than the other. So here we have in the top example a greater than operation with two sequences, first 5 and 7, and then 5 and 4. And Python does the comparison by going through the corresponding pairs, finding the first that differs. Well, first off, 5 and 5, those values don't differ, and then 7 and 4, well, those values do differ. And 7 is greater than 4, so the sequence with 7 is greater than the other. The, the left sequence is greater than the right sequence, so this operation returns true. In the second example, again, Python uh, finds the first pair that differs, and well, that's actually the pair at index 0. Here, 5 and 3, they differ, and 5 is greater than 3, so the left operand, the left sequence, is greater, so this operation is false. And lastly here, the same thing, but with a less than or equal to operation, well, again, 5 is neither less than or equal to 3, so again, this is false. And be clear that for the sake of these comparisons, two sequences are considered equal only when all of their values match and when they have the same number of values. So here comparison of equal lists with either less than or greater than will return false because neither is greater than or less than the other. Uh, with the less than or equal to or greater than equal to comparisons, both return true because the two sequences are equal. When, however, we're comparing two sequences where they have all the same matching values except one is longer than the other, well then, the sequence with more items is always considered greater. So the list 5 and 7 is always less than the list 5, 7, negative 9. And last thing to understand is that when the items of a sequence are compared, well, well, it's quite possible the items of a sequence are themselves sequences. And when that's the case, well, they're compared in the same manner. So effectively, the comparison is done recursively. Here, when we do a less than comparison on the two sequences, well, the first items in both of these sequences are themselves sequences. So we do a less than comparison on those two sequences. And we find that, well, no, 3, 9 is not less than 2, 5. So uh, already we found that the left operand is not less than the right operand. And so this returns false. Lastly, with the relational operators, strings again are also a kind of sequence. And so they have defined behavior with these relational operators. And the idea is really the same. The two strings are compared item by item until the first uh, pair that differs is found. And then that's used as the uh, basis of the comparison. And of course, the items which make up a string are the individual characters. The question then is that how does Python compare a pair of characters? And the answer is that it does so by their Unicode code points. So in the first example here, is hello less than hi? Well, it's the second characters of the string which are the first to differ. Is e less than i? Yes, it is, because the code point of lowercase e is less than the code point of lowercase i. So this operation evaluates true. In the second example, is hello greater than hell? Yes, it is, because the two sequences match, except hello is longer. And then, is hello less than or equal to hello? Yes, of course it is, because the two are equal. Is hello less than or equal to hell? 
No, because hello was actually greater than hill. Another sequence type we haven't yet discussed is called a range. A range is an immutable sequence of number values, but what makes a range differ from, say, a tuple that happens to consist of just number values is that a range doesn't actually store necessarily all of its values in memory. What does that mean? Well, we create a range using the range constructor found in the built-in namespace. So here we invoke the range constructor and we pass to it two arguments, two number values. Uh, the first is where the range is going to start, the sp second specifying where the range ends though actually it specifies one past the end of the range. So if you write range 630, what you get is a range representing the value 6 up to and including 29, not 30. So it's kind of strange because of the asymmetry. The, the first argument is included in the range, whereas the second argument isn't. It's actually one past. It's a bit strange at first, but then when you work with it in practice, you'll realize there actually is a good justification for this. It actually does usually uh, better reflect what we really want in most cases. In any case, you also see here the example of range with the arguments 0 and 10, so that's a range representing the value 0 up to and including 9. Again, one less than the second argument. In the third example, we provide just one argument, so the starting position is assumed by default to be 0. So this is actually, again, the range from 0 up to and including 9. And our last example, range with the arguments negative 6 and negative 2, that's a range that starts at negative 6 and goes up to and includes negative 3. Again, one less than the second argument. Now, if we were to create the equivalent tuple of some range, well, that tuple would store each and every value. A range object, in contrast, only has to store its starting value and its end value, or more, more accurately, one past its last value. What happens then, when you look up the value at a specified index of a range, Python just figures out what the value should be from logic. So here, for example, we create a range starting at 100, going up to, but not including 200, and assign that to x, and then we retrieve the value of this range at index 30. The range object returns the correct value 130, simply by taking its starting value 100 and adding 30 to it. Again, if this same range were expressed as a tuple, you'd have the whole sequence of values stored in memory, first with 100, then 101, then 102, 103, 104, 105, and that obviously takes up a lot more space. It's bad enough when you're talking about a sequence of 100 numbers or so, but just imagine you're talking about a thousand numbers or a million or more. When we create a range, we can optionally specify a third argument, which is known as the step. The step of a range by default is positive 1, and it denotes that from the start value, you get the next value uh, by incrementing by 1. If the step is something else, like positive 3, then you get the next value by incrementing by 3 rather than just 1. Or if the step is negative, which is perfectly possible, then you get the next value by decrementing. So in these examples, we first have range with the arguments 4, 14, and 3. That's a starting value of 4, an end value of 14, or rather one past the last value is 14, and a step of positive 3. So the sequence goes 4, 7, 10, 13, and then there's no 16 because 16 is greater than or equal to the end value, 14. In the second range example, we have a starting value of positive 5, an end value of negative 5, and a step of negative 2. So it, we start out at 5, then go to 3, 1, negative 1, and 3. And negative 5 itself is not included because negative 5 is less than or equal to the specified end value, which is negative 5. Negative 5, of course, is equal to negative 5. And then finally, in our third example, a range starting at negative 26, uh, going to negative 48 with a step of negative 5. That gets us a range of negative 26, negative 31, negative 36, negative 41, and negative 46. And then we don't go up to negative 51 because negative 51 is less than or equal to the end value of negative 48. So note the key difference between a positive step and a negative step. With a positive step, the values are included until they are greater than or equal to the terminated value whereas with a negative step, values are included until they are less than or equal to the end value. And understand that you can actually end up creating an empty range and Python won't stop you. It's not an error to create a range that has the starting value 10, a termination value of 20, and a step of negative 1. This will end up being an empty range because the first value, 10, itself is less than or equal to the terminator, which is positive 20. 
So if you were concerned that a range like this would start at 10 and keep decrementing off into infinity because it never crosses the threshold of positive 20, well, that's not actually how it works. It actually just starts out testing that no, it is less than or equal to the terminator, so it doesn't even have any values at all. And this, of course, is not the sort of range you would deliberately create, but it is a logical possibility. What's called an iterator is not a sequence per se, though in many circumstances it can be provided as a substitute to a normal sequence. What an iterator is, is really a wrapper around some other sequence, some actual sequence. And the idea of an iterator is it's basically like a placeholder we can use to iterate through an entire sequence, to go one by one from the start to the end of that sequence. So, say we have this three item list, which we assign to A, and from the list we can create an iterator over the list using the iter method of the list type, and we assign that to I, and with the iterator then we can invoke its next method, and each call to next will return the next value of the sequence which the iterator wraps over, starting from the first value. So, the first time we call next it returns 6, which is the first item in, in the list, the second call to next will return the second item of the list, and the third call to next will return the third item of the list. And then if we call next one more time, well, there is no fourth value in the list. We've exhausted the list, so the call to next will raise a stop iteration exception. So a couple key things to understand here is that the iterator object itself does not have a copy of the values of the list. It simply wraps the list. It has a reference to the list itself, and the iterator has internal state denoting where it currently is in the sequence basically what index is next. So be clear that each iterator has its own place marker over the sequence. If you take one sequence and you from it produce multiple iterators, well those iterators have different place markers. So here again, if we create an iterator which we assign to i, and then invoke next on that iterator, we get the first item of the sequence, which is again is 6, but then we create some second iterator, which we assign to i2, well what we do with one iterator won't affect what happens with the other. So next invoked on the original iterator will return 2 because that's what's next for that iterator, but the new iterator, if we invoke next, will return 6, which is the first item in the list. It'll start from the beginning because it represents a separate iteration over the list. Now we can also create iterators over maps. So here we have this dictionary with two items, the key 71 with the value moose and a key North Dakota with the value 11. Assign that to B and then create an iterator over the dictionary, which we assign to i. We invoke next on the iterator twice, getting the two keys of the dictionary in no particular order, and then the third call to next raises a stop iteration exception, because we've exhausted the iterator. We've iterated through all the items in the dictionary. So with map iterators, be clear on those two points. First, what you're iterating over are just the keys, not the values. And second, you iterate over the keys in no particular order. Now, again, the method names in Python that begin and end with double underscores, what that indicates is that generally you're not intended to invoke those methods directly. The proper way to invoke iter and next is to pass the objects to the built-in functions of the same name without, of course, the double underscores. I'm not really sure why Python did this. It would make more sense to me if you just had methods called iter and next with no double underscores, but for whatever reason, this is how it is. The last thing we'll say about iterators is that in Python, iterators are generally what we call live or active, meaning that if the underlying sequence object changes, then those changes may show up in the iterators which you have previously created from that object. So here again, we have the list uh, with three values and we assign it to A, we create the iterator from that object, and we invoke next on the iterator, getting the first item in the list, six. But then if we were to modify the second item in the list, here assigning it the value 77, and then invoke next on the iterator, that call to next doesn't return 2, which was the state of the sequence at the time the iterator was created. Instead, it returns 77, which is the new state of the second value in the list. So really what's going on with these iterators is they're really just blindly advancing through the indices each time next is called, and it's only until they go past the last valid index of the underlying collection, the underlying sequence, does it then raise the stop iteration exception. However, once next on an iterator has raised stop iteration, then all subsequent calls to next on that iterator will also raise stop iteration exception. Basically, once an iterator is exhausted, it's considered dead. So even if you were to update the underlying collection and, like, say, tack on new items at the end, 
uh, that's not going to make the iterator come back to life and start returning those values. It'll just keep throwing stop iteration exception. The other thing to watch out for is that with dictionaries, in the middle of iterating through all the values of a dictionary, yeah, the dictionary can be updated with new values, and the iterator will just blindly continue on. And you can actually also add and remove whole items from the dictionary, and any iterators previously created on that dictionary will blindly operate as if nothing has happened. However, if you call next on an iterator over a dictionary, where the dictionary has a different number of items than it had when the iterator was created, then the call to next will raise an exception. So dictionary iterator is still good, even if you modify the underlying dictionary, as long as the number of items is what the iterator expects each time you call next on that iterator. It's kind of some weird behavior, to be honest. I'm not really sure what justifies it. So now you're probably wondering what's so cool about iterators. Well, one of the most important uses is with Python's for in loop. Python doesn't have a regular for loop like JavaScript does. It only has for in, which is written for target, that is the name of some variable to be assigned to, uh, the reserved word in, which in this context has nothing to do with the reserved word in, which is the contains operator, that's totally separate here, uh, and then followed by an iterable which is some expression which returns an iterator or some object from which can be produced an iterator using the iter function. So most commonly a sequence like a list or a tuple or occasionally a, a map like a dictionary. And then of course at the end of this header line you have a colon denoting the end of the header followed by a body of statements indented underneath. What happens in the foreign is that the body is executed and in each run of the body the target is assigned each successive value of the iterable. So here, for example, for x in with an iterable, which is a list with the values 8, 3, and a string mu, uh, and then in the body we print x. Well, this is a loop that will iterate three times, and in the first run x will have the value 8, in the second it will have the value 3, and then in the third it will have the value of the string mu. So as you can see, the for and loop is a really convenient way of iterating over every item in some collection. Certainly more convenient than using a regular while loop, and I would say uh, foreign loops are actually used the vast majority of the time in Python code, while loops are only used in the minority of circumstances, because the vast majority of times when we want to loop over something, it's some collection where we want to go through all the values. Now, if there's one subtle thing about a foreign loop, it's that the variable, the target which we are assigning to in each iteration, that is just a variable of the local scope. So if you're in a function and you have a foreign loop that assigns to a variable x, well, that variable x actually just exists in the whole scope of the function. So whatever last value it was assigned in the last iteration of the loop, it'll still have that value after the loop. And this is just a good thing to know, because if you happen to use a variable name earlier in the function, which you then use as the target of a foreign loop, well, if you don't understand that it's actually the very same variable, then you might be screwing something up and not understand what's going wrong. What Python calls a list comprehension is a convenient construct for creating a list from some existing list or some other kind of iterable type. So say we have this list of four items, which we assign to the variable orig, as in original. And then from that list, we want to create a new list where all the items are the same, except they have double the value. Well, assuming we don't want to actually modify the existing list, the way we do this is create a new list, starting out as an empty list, then we would iterate using a foreign loop, we'd iterate through all the items in the original list, and in each iteration we would append to the new list the that value times 2, and we would end up with a list that reads 10, 6, 4, 20. Well, this is something Python programmers want to do commonly enough that it was decided they need a special construct to make it uh, more compact to express, because as we see here, it takes up a good three lines. First, we're creating the new list, assign it to a variable, and then iterating over the original list with a foreign loop, and then in the body of the list we're appending the values. With a list comprehension, we can do so in a single expression which returns the new list. And what the syntax for this looks like is a list literal, except instead of a list of values inside the square brackets, you have first an output expression, then the reserved word for, uh, and then a target, and then the reserved word in, just like in a foreign loop, there's for, target, in, and then finally the input, which is some iterable. What happens in the list comprehension is that implicitly there's some new list being created and we're iterating over the input uh, just like in a foreign loop and assigning its value to the target in each iteration and then the values that get added to the list 
are the values of the output expression. So here, for example, again, we have our original list with four items. And then from that, we create our new list using a list comprehension where the input is our original list, a ridge. Each item of the input is being assigned to the variable x. And then the output expression is x times 2. So when the list is iterated through 5, 3, 2, 10, first 5 is assigned to x. And then the output expression is evaluated. x times 2, 5 times 2 is 10. That's appended to the list. And then we go on to the second iteration, which is the value 3 assigned to x. 3 times 2 is 6, 6 appended to the list, and so forth. We go through the list in that manner. So really it's just a single expression which does all the same work as what we saw with the regular foreign loop. It's just this time we don't have to explicitly invoke append. That's sort of done implicitly. However, there is one real subtlety of a list comprehension, and that is that the target of the assignment is a variable which is local to the list comprehension itself. So what gets assigned to x in the list comprehension has no bearing on a variable x outside the list comprehension. And if we happen to have some variable also called x outside the list comprehension, it has no bearing on the x in the output expression. That's exclusively the x, which is the target in the list comprehension. So if we modified our example, where instead of assigning it to a variable named a ridge, we assign it to a variable named x, we can then use that variable in, as the input expression, uh, but then the target variable x is totally independent of that. There's really no relation here between the x, which is outside the list comprehension and which we're using in the uh, input expression that's totally separate from the x, which is the target and which is used in the output expression. So after the list comprehension is evaluated, the x outside the list comprehension still has the same value it did before. It still has the same list. It doesn't have, as you might expect, the value 10. Now, there actually is a little bit more to list comprehensions. This is the simplest form. You can actually make them a bit more complicated and more powerful, but we won't discuss that stuff here, so look in the supplementary notes. For many kinds of collections, it makes sense to convert them into some other kind of collection. Like, for example, if you have some tuple, if you want a list of all the same values as that tuple, you can create one simply by passing the tuple to the list constructor, and that gets you a list with all the same values. Uh, likewise, you can get a tuple with all the same values of, as a list uh, by passing the list to the tuple. Again, be clear, we're not actually modifying the existing objects, we're just creating new ones based off of those objects. So when I pass a range to the list constructor, what I get is a new list consisting of all of those same values. Note, though, that not all types can be converted into others this way. For example, I can't go the other way here and convert my list into a range by passing the list to the range constructor. That simply doesn't work. And there are some cases of conversions where they do work, but you have to be really clear about what exactly they do. Like, for example, here, if we create an iterator from this list with the values 1, 2, and 3, and then we invoke next on that iterator, well, we've partially consumed the iterator. And so if we then create a list from that iterator, what we get is a list with just the remaining values, not the values which have already been iterated through. The very last thing we'll discuss here about collections is that when it comes to dictionaries, Python has a requirement that the keys can't just be any object, they must be immutable. And moreover, if that object itself is composed of other items, as say a tuple is, a tuple is an immutable collection, well those items themselves also must be immutable. So it must be immutable all the way down. So here we see this first example where we're creating a dictionary with one item, where the key is itself a tuple but that tuple only contains numbers, and numbers are immutable kinds of objects, so this is okay. This is a valid kind of dictionary key. In the second example, the dictionary key is a list, an empty list, but that's not okay because a list is mutable. And then in the third example, the key is again a tuple, but one of the items of that tuple is itself a list, and lists are mutable, so this key isn't entirely immutable even though the tuple itself is immutable. The, the tuple can't be modified to point to some other list or to some other object in the, at that index, but the object referenced by the tuple can itself be modified. So this tuple is not a valid dictionary key. And just to drive home that a key has to really be immutable all the way down, here we're trying to create a dictionary where the key is a tuple, but that tuple contains a tuple which itself contains a list, and lists are mutable. So this tuple is not a valid dictionary key. The reason Python dictionaries have this requirement for their keys has to do with how Python performs a lookup on a dictionary key. The way the lookup is performed relies upon the keys having unchanging values. 
if a key could change, Python wouldn't be able to locate its position in memory.